going to ask you to settle in just a little bit, if you can. <laughs> Today, um, I was just so happy that, that I was able to bring this message. It's called The Art of Being on Purpose. And we're continuing on this month's um, theme of the celebration of you. So just breathe in deeply. And I'm going to ask you to come on a journey with me today. Just for a few moments, if you wish. Close your eyes. And imagine a time long ago. A time very, very long ago, before you were a physical being when you were pure essence. Breathe in and let your breath go. You had no form. You had no personality, no name, no gender, no race, no identity of your own. You were one in the essence and the allness of God. Now get an image in your mind's eye of what that might look and feel like. Is it swirling colors? Bright white light? Pulsating energy? An all-pervading, all-encompassing sense of love, of peace, and calm. Now imagine that essence and allness of God so fully desire to be known and experience more of its own self that from its own creative self, its own creative nature, a soul being described as you is created and sent to a mission on earth. At that moment, you come forth from the soup of creation. Also at that moment, you clearly and unequivocally understand your mission because you hear God say, go to the earth, my beloved, and be an individualized expression of me. Go to the earth and be my love, be my peace, be my creativity, be my givingness, be my joy, be my eyes, be my ears, be my hands. And you are ready. You are ready and excited to come to this earthly expression and be all of this. You are ready and excited to be an individualized expression of God. Feel that original excitement and enthusiasm just for a minute, and be with it, bask in it. Just as you are ready to burst forth into the human experience, you hear God say, by the way, you won't remember any of this by the time you get there. And so now you sit here this morning, and here you are your true essence, the soul being that you are, surrounded by a garment of flesh and bone, enveloped in a bundle of beliefs, labels, misinformation, experiences, and erroneous impressions. Like that unpolished gem that Reverend Margaret spoke of a couple weeks ago. So as you feel yourself ready, return to your physical self, come back to this room, remaining comfortable, take a couple breaths and open your eyes, be with me again if you like. I think we've all heard this story, I know I've heard it several times, but I just, I just like it, so I decided I would, I would say it again, there was a little four-year-old boy he had a new baby in his family, and he just clamored at his parents to let him go and be alone with that baby. And he just wouldn't let up. He wanted desperately to be alone with his new baby. And his parents were a little weary because they couldn't figure out why on earth a four-year-old would want to be alone with this, with this baby. But they decided to 
um, they had the baby monitor, so they could put the baby monitor in the room, and so they let the little four-year-old go in. And what they discovered, or what they gathered from um, his conversation, was it sounded like he went up to the baby's crib and put his face as close to the baby's as he could, and he whispered, baby, baby, tell me what God is like. I'm beginning to forget. Well, we do forget, but today we have a chance to remember. In fact, we are here at this time consciously to remember who we have come here to be. And that is what the art of being on purpose is all about. In the Science Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes writes, the eternal has placed itself at the center of our being in order that we may function individually. The discovery of this, the greatest truth of humankind, is the greatest discovery of the ages. And this is the greatest truth of humankind. I'm going to offer you a challenge. Could this morning be the morning that you take everything that you have heard and experienced this month so far and use it to awaken from the illusion of your separateness from God? The greatest and most profound culmination of this month would be that this morning you would walk out of here rediscovering your inherent truth and beginning to live more fully from a place of being. So what does that mean to live from a place of being? It really is just another way of saying we see God's presence in everything all the time. It is in through, manifested as us, around us, always, and in all ways, regardless of what circumstances or conditions in your life look like. Jesus told us how to live from a place of beingness. When he said, judge not according to appearances, but judge ye by righteous judgment. And righteous judgment is simply seeing God at the center of conditions. The people who closely, who are closest in mastering this art of being, therefore, <coughs> these are the ones who refuse to be run by their conditions. They know that God is not defined by the human condition. God is perfection being expressed in and through its creation in every holy instant. And every instant is holy. Krishnamurta, who is an Eastern sage, said this. He told his secret. He said, this is my secret. I don't mind what happens. This is one who has definitely mastered the art of being, and that could be you this morning. Because the thing about this human journey is that we're all on it, and as long as we are on it, we will experience a continuum of peaks and valleys and highs and lows, and it goes on and on and on <laughs> until we leave the planet. <clears throat> when I read the title of this, this uh, talk today, I was reminded of a book written by Rick Warren several years ago. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. And Rick Warren is a uh, minister in a mega church in California it's called Saddleback. And I read that book, and I, I can't say that I agree with everything that he had to say, but he did have a way of looking at this peak and valley that really spoke to me, and it's a, it's a little shift in perception. He shared in an interview that the previous year before he, when he wrote his book, it was the greatest and one of the most difficult years he had known. And his book sold 15 million copies, and that brought him notoriety of wealth like he'd never known before. And his wife, Kay, got an aggressive form of cancer. And he said that he used to think of life as hills and valleys that you go through the bad times, and then you go to the mountaintop, and then you go back and you go forth. But he doesn't feel that way anymore. Instead, he believes that we experience life as um, 
the valleys and the mountaintops at the same time. And he pictured it as a railroad track running parallel simultaneously, good, bad, hard, rough. So, in fact, he says that any given experience can be both a mountaintop and a valley experience. Mm -hmm. So his wife's cancer, I think, would certainly be considered a valley from one perspective. Yet he said, and I quote, we discovered quickly that Kay's journey through cancer was not going to be easy for her. It has been very difficult for her, and yet God has strengthened her character, given her ministry of helping other people, given her testimony, and drawn her closer to God and to others. And about his book selling 15 million copies, well, we certainly would think that would be a mountaintop experience. But here's what he said about that. All of a sudden, when the book sold 15 million copies, it made me instantaneously very wealthy. It also brought a lot of notoriety that I had never had to deal with before. <clears throat> this was very difficult, and I didn't know what to do with it, so I began to ask God what he wanted me to do with his money, his notoriety, and influence. And so Rick Warren was guided to do some pretty marvelous things, such as he stopped taking his salary from his church, he set up foundations called um, the the Peace Plan, an initiative that plants churches and equips leaders, it takes care of the poor and the sick, and it helps for education for the next generation. And then he added up all the money that he had earned in the 24 years since he started the church and gave it all back. No matter how good things are, there is always something that needs to be worked on. And no matter how challenging things are, there's always <laughs> something to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. You can focus on your purpose, or you can focus on your problems. If you focus on your problems, you only increase the pain of the problems. But one of the easiest ways to get rid of pain is to get your focus off yourself and onto God's purpose your life. Well, not all of us have these um, dynamic and big experiences of selling 15 million books like Rick Warren did, but I'm sure that all of us have um, had experiences, and I call them reminders. And some of you may know this story, but um, two years ago, on February 5th, I was called up to the HR office and told that I was terminated from my job of 28 years. And the HR guy said, you are terminated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, a part of me was terminated. <laughs> At that moment, I discovered that part of me had forgotten what my true purpose was, and that I believed that I was my job. And so I went through a very hard period of tears, of sleepless nights, anxiety attacks, big time, not knowing who I was, not knowing how to be in this world. If I was not that person who got up every day, Monday through Friday, sat at my desk from 8 to 5, who was I? So I was truly forced into figuring it out. And it wasn't easy. But at that time, I was, I was very fortunate to meet a man called Michael Stillwater, and some of you might know him. He's a troubadour. He goes around the world singing songs, healing songs. He's an intuitive man. As a matter of fact, if you check the web website for Michael Stillwater, he's offering uh, a healing retreat in Italy with his music. Anyway, he said to me, <laughs> he said to me, you know, it sounds to me like you didn't lose your job. It just sounds like you got a new employer. <laughs> yes. And that, that, was, that was it. That was my turning point. And I remembered that God is my source. Mm -hmm. And that all that God is, I am. And so now today, here I am, standing in front of you at this place called the Joyful Gathering. It is my... Um, <coughs> my joy to be a part of, and when I'm not here teaching classes or talking to you on Sunday mornings, 
You'll find me at Cooper University Hospital doing my true work, the work of my heart that I know that I was born to do, and that's being a chaplain. So truly, truly, I am very grateful. So now, I'd like to spend a few more minutes helping you get your focus on God's purpose for your